morning dear sisters and brothers welcome to day break every day is a precious gift of our loving god to us so we ought to thank and praise him for his infinite love for us let us now join the choir in thanking and praising him of certain people convey profound lessons to us so let us tune our ears to listen to one such anecdote friends morning has broken and let us make this day with a virtue embedded in our hearts once there lived a pious old man he had lived a good life always pleasing to god he did everything right before men and before others in fact he considered himself as serving god in whatever you he did and when he became old 
and he wanted to retire. And he prayed to God, God, you know me, your servant. You know that I did everything in order to please you. I did everything in order to glorify you. Now that I am getting old, I want to make sure of a good future. Please bless me. Give me a blessing that I will win the lottery and become rich for the rest of my life so that my future will be secure and I will not have to worry about anything. And so he said the prayer and he repeated the prayer every day and after six months he found no result. He felt that God was not answering his prayer and he began to complain. He began to complain and tell God God, why don't you listen to my prayer? Why don't you bless me? Why don't you take care of my future? Didn't I live a beautiful life before you? Didn't I do everything right before you and before others? And God suddenly got annoyed. And he answered the older man. But... You, my son, why are you agitated? You are praying to me that you will win a lottery. But first, why don't you buy the lottery itself? Why don't you buy the lottery? And so the old man was heckled by God. My dear brothers and sisters, this is what all of us do. We want blessings from heaven. We want God to take care of us. And we stay idle. We send up prayers to heaven. And we remain idle. And so much so, God cannot bless us. Or God cannot help us. Because otherwise, we are expecting a Magic. We are not expecting a miracle. A miracle happens when we offer to God something that is part of our life. We must give into the hands of God that which belongs to us, even the little material that we have, so that he can bless us with a miracle. And that is why when Jesus saw 5,000 men and women sitting before him the whole day. And he felt that they had not eaten anything. Jesus asked his disciples, What do you have in your hands? What do you have in your hands? And it is there, they said, there is a boy with two bread and one fish. And Jesus said, bring it to me. And they brought it to him, and he blessed it and multiplied it. And thus it became more than enough, sufficient for that big crowd. And so today, let us once again understand the true meaning of what we have reflected so far in the words of St. Paul to the Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 10, while we were with you, we said clearly that if anyone is not willing to work, neither should that one eat. And so we cannot expect to remain idle and expect God to fill us. We must provide something, a little of what we have of our own hard work and offer it to God. And in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 11, When I was a child, 
I thought and reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I gave up childish ways. So this means to say that I cannot be spoon-fed always. There is a time when I have to act and then I have to approach God and God will be more than ever ready to multiply what we have produced ourselves. Let this be the virtue that we embed today in our hearts. Certainly, the anecdote you have just listened to has conveyed a message for your life. Saints were ordinary people like you and me, but they had an extraordinary desire to lead a holy life. The Catholic Church has several saints. Let us now listen to the life of the saint of the day. St. Julian Billiard was born in 1751 and died in 1816. As a child, playing school was Julia's favorite game. When she was 16, to help support her family, she began to teach for real. She sat on a haystack during the noon recess and told the biblical parables to the workers. Julia carried on this mission of teaching throughout her life, and the congregation she founded continues her work. Julia was the fifth of seven children. She attended a little one-room school in Culvalee. She enjoyed all of her studies, but she was particularly attracted to the religion lessons taught by the parish priest. Recognizing something special in Julia, the priest secretly allowed her to make her first communion at the age of nine, when the normal age at that time was 13. She learned to make short mental prayers and to develop a great love for Jesus in the Eucharist. A murder attempt on her father shocked her nervous system badly. A period of extremely poor health for Julia began and was to last for 30 years. For 22 of these years, she was completely paralyzed. All of her sufferings and pain she offered up to God. In 1790, the pastor of Kovali was replaced by a priest who had taken the oath prescribed by the revolutionary authorities. This meant he pledged allegiance to the government over the Catholic Church's authority. Julia rallied the people to boycott him. When the French Revolution broke out, Julia offered her home as a hiding place for loyal priests. Because of this, Julia became a hunted prey. Five times in three years, she was forced to flee in secret to avoid compromising her friends who were hiding her. At this time, she was privileged to receive a vision. She saw her crucified Lord surrounded by a large group of religious women, dressed in a habit she had never seen before. An inner voice told her that these would be her daughters, and that she would begin an institute for the Christian education of young girls. She and a rich young woman founded the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namer. A friend brought her to Amiens to the house of Visconte de Bourdin after the Reign of Terror. There she met Francis Blin de Borden, who became her friend and worked with her. At Amiens, the two women and a few companions began living a religious life in 1803. Daily, Francis and a small group of pious women gathered in Julia's sick room for the sacrifice of the Mass. Throughout the French Revolution, 1794 to 1804, Julia encouraged the group in their works of charity. Heightened persecution forced Julia and Francis to move to a house belonging to the Doria family where, with a group of women, they conducted catechetical classes for the villages. There, Julia met Father Joseph Varin, who was convinced that the saint was meant to achieve great works. When Francis and Julia returned to Amiens, they laid the foundations of the Sisters of Notre Dame, whose objects were to see to the religious education of poor children, the Christian education of girls of all classes, and the training of religious teachers. In 1805, Julia and three companions made their profession and took their final vows. She was elected as Mother General of the Young Congregation. 
At a mission held by the Fathers of the Faith of Amiens in 1804, the teaching of women was given to the Sisters of Notre Dame. At the end of the mission, Father Enfantine asked Julia to join him in a novena without telling her why, and on the fifth day, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, he ordered her to walk. After 22 years as an invalid, at the age of 44, she got up and realized that she was cured. Now fully functional, she worked to extend the new foundation and to assist at missions conducted by the Fathers of the Faith in other towns. She did this until the missionary work was halted by the government. The educational work continued, however, and more convents were opened. In 1815, Mother taxed her ever poor health by nursing the wounded and feeding the starving left from the Battle of Waterloo. For the last three months of her life, she again suffered much. She died peacefully on April 8, 1816, at 64 years of age. Julia was beatified on May 13, 1906, and was canonized by Pope Paul VI in 1969. Her feast day is celebrated on April 8. Julia's immobility in no way impeded her activities. In spite of her suffering, she managed to co-found a teaching order that tended to the needs of both the poor and the well-to-do. Each of us has limitations, but the worst malady any of us can suffer is the spiritual paralysis that keeps us from doing God's work on earth. Let us pray. Lord, you have told us that you live forever in the hearts of the chaste. By the prayers of the Virgin Julia Billiard, help us to live by your grace and remain a temple of your spirit. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray today for all victims of prejudice. O oh Lord, protect and defend those who are discriminated against because of race, color, class, language, or religion, that they may be accorded the rights and dignity which are theirs. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. After listening to the life of the saint of the day, aren't you inspired to lead a new life of holiness? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Yes, Lord, your word is indeed the light to my path. Dear sisters and brothers, let us now listen to today's Bible reflection through daily bread. Praise the Lord. Your reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect of anyone, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, today we reflect on a promise made Jesus about God granting justice to us. And this promise is given against the background of a parable that looks rather scandalous. A parable of a widow and a judge. It would seem that the judge stands in the, in the place of God and the widow in our place. A judge who does not fear God or respect human beings. A person who doesn't care for anyone or fear anyone. A very strange parable indeed. 
can one speak about God in these terms? For this we should know what a parable is. A parable is not just telling exactly how God is. There could be a parable of contrast or comparison. The parable has only one main point to make. A parable takes an episode, an incident, an event in the nature and makes use of it to explain something that is heavenly. A earthly reality placed side by side as a heavenly reality to tell us what the kingdom of God is like, to tell us how God is like, in order to explain to something that we do not see or know or hear through what we see and hear. So here Jesus uh, brings the parable of an unjust or wicked judge. A judge who does not fear God, does not believe in God, or does not care for human beings. But at the same time, this judge is forced, not by fear, but sheer botheration of a widow who comes repeatedly praying for justice. So a person who has been not just of fearing anybody or respecting anybody, if such a person can be moved to action in favor of a poor widow, then how much more will God grant your petition? God is not a cruel judge. God loves you. He is your father, Jesus is telling. If such a judge can be moved by the sad plight and the insistence, the consistency, the perseverance of that widow, then how much more would God grant us? So he is asking not to give up hope. Go on praying. Praying till you receive what you are asking for. Pray with the trust. Pray with confidence that God is your father and he will grant whatever is needed. But this promise ends with a question, and the question is also very important. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That is a question addressed to the disciples, and a question addressed to each one of us. When does the Son of Man come? Two ways. The Son of Man coming is every day, but there is also a coming at the end. The coming at the end to perfect everything. The son of man coming as the judge sitting on a cloud. So it is asked, will we remain faithful to the end? Or will we give up? The son of man comes and it is said there is a possibility that many will lose faith. In the apocalyptic discourses about the last coming, last things, Jesus very often tells about this event. There will be a loss of faith, a general loss of faith among people. People who do not believe anymore. Even those who believe, those who used to believe, lose their faith, abandon God and abandon their faith. In such a way that only very few will remain at the end faithful. We are forced to give a reply. Do we really believe? Do we remain faithful to God? Have we faith and trust in God, or we also have abandoned it? We see a loss of faith all over the world. Many countries which used to be Christian, 100% Christian, now is considered as atheistic or secularistic, with no religion at all. Many who used to believe in Christ and God find no more meaning in these realities. Many who used to go to church and receive sacraments now find it useless and meaningless. And many have abandoned their faith. On the other side, we see also growing of faith. So here each one has to answer this question. When the Son of God comes, when Jesus comes, will he f find faith in me? If he is to visit me today, this moment, what will he find? A believer? An agnostic, a secularist, an atheist, one who believes or one who does not believe, it is up to us to decide. So let us keep the faith and remember that Jesus will come. Jesus will come to take us home. Jesus will come to put an end to this history, perfect it, transform it, 
and inaugurate the kingdom of God that lasts forever. Let us not lose our faith. It is the Holy Spirit that instills and fosters the faith. So let us pray to the Holy Spirit to enable us to believe firmly and live as Jesus has asked us to live. Let's conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great promise that you will hear our prayer. Even though at times we seem, we think that you do not hear us, that our prayers go unheard, still we believe that you hear us, that you are our loving Father who cares for us and provides for every need of ours. Enable us to believe firmly and remain in your love forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope that today's Bible reflection has given you new insights and enriched you spiritually. As we come to the end of this episode of Daybreak, let us once again thank the Lord with this beautiful hymn. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure. All of my days are held in your hands, crafted into your perfect. Gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life through.
Hold me, guide me, lead me, walk beside me. I give my life to the porter's hand. Sisters and brothers, I believe that the last half an hour has really been a blessing for you. Until we meet again, stay blessed. <laughs>